Go for it. Awesome. Perfect. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Harley. I uh, came all the way here from Dallas, Texas, actually, so pretty far. Um, Jason, the original speaker, oh, also our other original speaker was not here as well, so there's been some changes. Um, so I am the one speaking. I am a core developer for Truebit. I've been working on Truebit for about six months now, so it's been a while. Um, we have a lot of pretty exciting things. Um, oh, how do I change the slides? Up here? OK. Perfect, I can do that. Um, so, oops. clicker, yeah. Oh. Which one? Oh. Is it? Is it working? Oh, that one. Perfect. I was just shooting laser beams at everyone. Um, oh, the pointer, or I thought this changed the slides. Yeah. Oh. Oh, which one? The lower one. The lower one. That's the other one I didn't try. Alrighty. Yep. Okay. So let me start with um, what Truebit is. Um, Truebit is a platform for running a decentralized computation that typically doesn't fit within the gas limit. So that is a big limitation of computation with Ethereum is that this gas limit, which is there for a very good reason, um, but not all applications you know, can really fit in that. And you still want to be able to, mostly what you use Truebit for is for checking for whether or not people are doing the correct computation, which is typically what you use a blockchain for. So. Um, yeah, the problem is that decentralized computation is expensive, like we talked about, or I mentioned earlier. Um, you have the gas limit. You also just you know, have to run stuff with Ethereum and pay for gas. The other thing is that, yeah, and decentralized computation is bounded by the gas limit. So like I said, um, Web 3.0, it can't quite happen because we need to really scale up the level of computation that we can do. Um, so this is a pretty simple. Uh, diagram for how it works. So we have a tip simple dApp user right here, and they sort of have a contract that's running a computation. So one example might be live fear, actually. So they're our first milestone for an application. So maybe it's the live fear um, transcoders or other users, and they're triggering something here. And then it will go and call a Truebit contract and have them sort of create a task. And um, it's pretty, pretty simple, like API. Um, and what will happen is that there are all these Truebit miners who are running um, computation off-chain, and they will be executing this task. So, and here is where it gets a little bit more complicated. So we have, um, here is our C++ code. Um, so in the case of uh, live fear, they have things like ffprobe or ffmpeg, and we can actually compile that down to WASM, and I'll just share a little quick thing why we're targeting WASM. The reason why we're targeting WASM is that it's supported by all browsers, and it's a computation platform that a lot of different languages can um, target and uh, use. So we want to target WASM because it's sort of like a good base layer for computation. And you know, there's projects like eWASM and stuff like that. So the C or C++ code gets compiled into WebAssembly, um, WASM, whatever you want to call it, uh, via mscripten. And we have software related to that. Then um, we'll let the person uh, create the task, and the different Truebit miners will um, run that WebAssembly code using our off chain interpreter, which is written in OCaml. And there's a bunch of different steps that go on with that, but eventually the um, you know, different data or whatever can get uploaded to the blockchain, or it could be IPFS, et cetera. Um, we also have this, we also have um, the WASM task, so it doesn't just get solved, but there's, you know, obviously it's a blockchain, so there's like money related to this. Um, and the way it works is that uh, the task giver will give a reward and a minimum deposit, and so there's different staking. So if at any point someone doesn't follow our protocol and it can be proven, then those people will be slashed. Um, and that is all handled in our uh, incentive layer. Um, the cool thing about Truebit is that you know, 
if someone does the computation and what if they don't do it right? Well, the way it works is that you can um, run pretty much 99% of the code off chain and then you can use a sort of our on-chain stepper, what we also call dispute resolution layer, to actually prove um, fraud. And then those people will get slashed. And so those are some of the related inputs and outputs. Um, so I already discussed about WebAssembly, so I won't go into that too much. Um, so Truebit is, uh, I, I like to think of it as a very elegantly simple system. The, um, Verification game is pretty simple. Uh, it was actually created by Christian over here um, related to solving the Doge Ethereum bridge. Um, but there are obviously with any you know, programming or software, there are like interesting design challenges and this is a very new space. So one issue is floating point. Um, and the reason why floating point is an issue is because it's, uh, for WebAssembly it's an issue because the WebAssembly spec doesn't specify how it's supposed to happen because they want it to be optimized by certain hardware. Well, obviously, if you're hashing different floating point numbers, no matter even if they're you know, very, very similar, they're going to give different hashes, so you don't have determined computation. Um, and Sammy, actually, our other developer, has developed some interesting floating point emulation, and there's different ways to sort of solve this problem. Uh, the other thing is determining the task reward. So this is kind of related to like how much do you know how do you know up front like, how much to pay someone for these different things? Because we don't exactly have, like, you know, Ethereum, you can kind of get estimates for gas, so it's a similar issue. Like, you know how much, you don't really, you know how many like, steps it's going to cost, but sometimes you don't know how much gas it's going to cost and things like that. So that's an interesting problem that we've um, been working on. Uh, another, probably the biggest limitation for us is because, you know, obviously we want to do big computations, which usually requires big data. Um, the biggest issue is, you know, having this data availability problem, and this is a really tough problem that, uh, you know, that everyone, I think, in this space is sort of facing, and so um, we're definitely looking into different ways to solve that and other people, um, how they're solving it. So other issues are around token mechanics, you know, how do you relate token mechanics to all these different, you know, like computations, so like you're pricing the computation, but if your token is like deflating and things like that, so there's like all these crazy variables that go into this. Um, exchange rates, like, you know, how much if you're exchanging um, Ethereum into a, a Truebit token or whatever, like how do you know how that's related to the computation, so these are interesting problems. The other thing is, uh, what's called a dandelion attack, and it's a pretty interesting one. So let's say you're a live peer task giver, and then some malicious person like Sammy over here says that every time that live peer submits a task, I'm going to challenge it. And even though I'm going to lose, it's still going to delay what you're doing. And so that's kind of a problem. Um, and that will kind of disincentivize people from uh, like submitting tasks if you know that some not nice person is going to like challenge you um, just for no reason. So. Uh, so we, if anyone's familiar with Truebit, um, we sort of colloquially refer our what the, was written in the Truebit white paper as Truebit Classic. So that involves um, forced errors and a jackpot. And the way that works is that whenever someone, uh, like at a probabilistic rate, when someone submits a solution, they also submit a fake solution. And this is to check if verifiers are actually checking or not. And so if um, verifiers are incentivized to challenge because, or to at least check, because they want to get this jackpot related to the forced error. Um, but this is an interesting way, and we've actually been discussing uh, another uh, model, which we call Truebit Beta, where um, task giver gives you a task. So, like I said earlier, submit solution. That's fine. Um, yeah. So this is pretty basic, but the idea is that Truebit Beta doesn't give a forced error. And the reason why that's difficult and not yet implemented is because the forced error is really key for incentivizing verifiers. Um, and we really want verifiers to you know, check stuff because that's how you get security. So how do you, uh, you know, incentivize verifiers without sort of this interesting forced error jackpot mechanism that has its own sort of related problems? And there's some extra stuff that Jason would have been much better at explaining than me. Um, but, so that's it. Um, any questions? Oh. 
I can talk about it if you want, but uh, do I have to? Um, oh, I guess I can talk about something else. So the thing I've been working on is uh, TrueBit OS. So I didn't, yeah, that's kind of a buzzwordy calling stuff OS. But the idea is that we have a, um, so the TrueBit nodes will have you know, clients that are running off chain. Um, but there's like different versions of TrueBit out there and there's all these different pieces. And so the idea was we could build this system called TrueBit OS where you can actually compose um, different modules together to build the sort of um, TrueBit client that you want for your specific problem. And we're um, actually, it's pretty close to being done and we'll be using it for the LiveFear integration. So if anyone wants to check that out on our GitHub. Uh, yeah, so that, that's actually it. Yeah, so the way that live here works is that someone will submit the, um, the code that they were running and they will, um, so with live here people will actually already have submitted their solutions and the idea is that TrueBit will then rerun that computation and then a solver will run that and run it again and then a verifier will check that solver. But you can kind of, it's, Life here is an interesting case because uh, you can kind of think as that the original solver as the person checking the original live fear people as well. So that's kind of how that example works. Um, what they would be doing is they would simply just be checking that the solution that the original that came from live fear was actually correct. And so that way, um, because the live fear contracts themselves can't check like these video transcodings because it doesn't fit within you know like in solidity. So they would use TrueBit to sort of offload that and then get the correct solution. But then how do you know if TrueBit did the right thing? So that's why TrueBit has sort of like the extra level of security. Hopefully that answers the question. You in the back? And we'll go back to the slide the TVM context. The which one? TVM context. Uh, tell me when to stop. Yeah, I was just No, that's a great question, actually. Uh, so you could use different languages like Rust. So one thing is that WebAssembly doesn't support garbage collection. Um, so that is an interesting detail. Um, so that's why other languages may not exactly be supported. However, it is certainly possible, and people have compiled like different languages like Python or like C Sharp to WebAssembly. So that could be possible. Um, there's definitely I don't see any reason why um, we can't support those languages. But at the moment the best languages to sort of like target would be C and C++ or Rust or any sort of non-garbage collected language. So Rust is an interesting case because they're trying to be sort of like the language for WebAssembly. So there's like some sort of like native Rust compilation where you can compile Rust into WebAssembly, um, but MScript is sort of like the main tool for compiling different languages into WebAssembly. Um. So do you guys have a roadmap? Um, like how is development going? Um, I would say development is going pretty well. I guess it depends on who you ask. Um, but uh, yeah, we don't have like a really specific roadmap, but the biggest milestone that we're sort of targeting right now is the live peer integration. And so once we kind of have that, then we'll be ready to sort of support other teams. And we've had a bunch of other projects like Ocean Protocol and Aragon who've also wanted to build on it. So we'll pretty much just be, as we're developing it, we'll also be trying to sort of onboard these other teams to use our uh, tools. So can you give us any dates? I, no. <laughs> Um, I, so it depends because with the mscript and module wrapper, we are doing some extra stuff in there. So we're in mscript and we have our own wrapper around that. So there's some extra stuff. However, you can, um, 
do like really simple like WASM tests, and I think you yeah you can run like just pretty basic um, WebAssembly stuff that you haven't sort of like pre-processed. But anything sort of more complex, you sort of need to do this pre-processing step. Yeah, um, so the, in the white paper it hasn't changed too much, but yeah, so a solver is just someone who is waiting for a task to be created, they commit to solving that task, they're given a time frame to do it, and they run the computation and they submit the solution. And, and in most normal cases of Truebit, no one will challenge, um, and then they get their money and they go on their way. Now in the case where a verifier, so what they'll be doing is they'll be watching for solutions to be submitted, so there's a, some event, right? And so they will then go and get the code, they'll download it, they'll check it themselves, and if they're like, hey, you didn't do, this isn't correct, and then they'll go and challenge it. Um, and then they, so the verifier is sort of the other party in the verification game, as opposed to the solver. Wouldn't it be, um, like we have to say that, since, since both of them are solving it, wouldn't you always need a solver, and then if you disagree with someone else's solution, you would become a verifier? Is that how it is, or is it disjunct mode? Um, it's, yeah, yeah, they're, um, you are right. So they are, it's pretty much the same code, but in terms of like, just who is like sort of playing the game, we sort of use these terms to, um, it would probably be on the same machine, so you'd be running solvers and verifiers on the same machine, but we use the like terminology solver and verifier to more make the distinctions when we're uh, developing the code, and also in the white paper, because they, the code is, very similar, but slightly different um, in terms of what methods they call. Is there, is there an incentive difference? Is it like preferable to be a solver or preferable to be a verifier? Yeah, so that's what the white paper goes in. So the white paper, the forced errors and the jackpots is really meant for incentivizing verifiers because incentivizing solvers is pretty easy. Like I can just submit a task and you're the solver and I pay you to solve the task, right? But you're sort of not incentivized to really give me the right answer. You're kind of incentivized to give me 42 every single time unless someone's like actually checking you, right? Because you don't want to waste your computational resources if no one's gonna like catch you. Is there a single winner for these solvers? A single winner? Is it like winner takes all the first one to come up with the answer gets the full bounty? Or is it like, hey, there's three people that happen to solve this problem. They might agree on the correct answer or one might submit 42 and stand out. Yeah, so in Tribit Beta, I think we were playing around with multiple solvers, but in Tribit Classic, the way it works is that the miners choose, so it's really just whoever calls register for task, um, or like um, first, and whoever gets through to the like Ethereum, and then anyone else who tried to call that method, it'll just revert on them. And so, they and they could become verifiers if they wanted to, yeah. Uh, I don't see why not. I guess you would. I guess it depends on how the smart contracts work. I haven't really looked into like how other um, EVM-based um, languages work, but I, I don't see any reason why not. Yeah. Alrighty, all great questions. Um, How's the Litecoin bridge coming? The what? The Litecoin bridge. Oh, the the Doge bridge? Oh, yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. It, it's coming along. We, we've been we've been a little busy with other stuff, but it'll it'll happen. There's some there's an art project too related to it, so that's been making a lot of progress. Uh, alrighty, I think it's Christian's turn now. Please. <laughs> Here is it interference or I don't know. Ah, yeah, maybe.